Hello, this is Pastor Don Long, and here we are on the uh, News from Another Perspective portion of our uh, weekly broadcast. Last week, we began a series uh, talking about Israel's right to exist. <clears throat> we mentioned the fact that uh, there was a university in uh, the United Kingdom that had sponsoring a con uh, conference on does Israel have a right to exist. <clears throat> I raised the question of whether maybe that university has a right to exist, but uh, I'm following along with an article written by George Phillips, <clears throat> who was uh, very active in Congress as an assistant to one of the congressmen from New Jersey, uh, working specifically in human rights. And uh, we were talking last week about uh, the United Nations, about some of the insane things that happened there, but I won't get back on that. Uh, we're really focused on the false claims that are being made about Israel. And unfortunately, our, our media today is, is pretty much biased against Israel, but that's the result of, of our education, starting in our high schools, going on through especially our colleges. Our colleges are, uh, have vast seats and segments and departments that are very vocally anti-Israel, anti-Jewish. I, I made a comment that if we had riots on campuses, people marching around saying death to the Arabs or death to the Muslims, uh, there'd be, you know, front page news uh, about it, but such things happen saying death to the Jews on our college campuses and prestigious college campuses at that, and it doesn't tend to make the nightly news, let you know about the dangerous times in which we live, uh, times that the Bible calls the end times. I was talking with a former leader in um, Fitchburg uh, today and made the, the comment that the Bible uh, says that we're going to come into a time when men call evil good and they call good evil. And uh, he looked at me and said, well, gee, was that in the Bible? I said, it certainly is. And then reflected that he and I being the same age that we could never conceive of the things that are accepted under the guise of political correctness these days. Again, uh, another topic for another uh, day. Let's get on with the, the false claims about uh, Israel. Uh, I want to recap the two that I touched on last week. False claim number one was that the Jews were out of Israel for almost 2,000 years, so they have no right to the land. Uh, that's not true. Jews have always been in the land. You find uh, in the 600s, in fact, that when the Persian Empire came to take over that area of the Middle East, that there were Jews ruling in Jerusalem. There were Jewish scribes in the 11th, 7th, and 11th centuries working there. Even Napoleon in uh, 1799, when he conquered the Middle East, offered uh, to invite the Jews to form a state, the Jews who were living there. So there were always Jews living in the land, despite what other people might want you to believe. Uh, false claim number two was that Israel came about only because of the Zionist movement in the late 19th century. Now, uh, it certainly didn't come about that. As a, as a Bible believer, I believe that Israel is a direct a result of God's prophecy, God prophesied very clearly. The prophets told us there would come a day when God would call his people from the four nations of the world. They would come back to their homeland, Israel. The mountains of Israel would once again be uh, populated. Uh, several weeks ago, I was uh, interviewing some of our young people who have been on trips to Israel with us about some of those uh, cities in the West Bank, uh, in Judea and Samaria. And uh, so I, w I was talking all about that as well. And, and certainly I believe that's why they came back. But stepping outside of a biblical point of view, stepping outside of, you know, a prophetic point of view, simply to look at history itself. The 19th century, uh, we, we said, was in fact a century where nation states were rising and nationalism was true for many nations. And I mentioned the fact that in 1942, there were only 62 countries in the world. Today, there's 196. So back then, 62, how did we get to 196? There were uh, nation states being created left and right as nationalist movements were coming against uh, the powers that, that had them in, in sway and were establishing nations. At the end of World War I, uh, the great Ottoman Empire was split up by the victorious allies, primarily France and Britain. The Ottoman Empire controlled all of the Middle East. And when they were in control, there was no Iran, there was no Iraq, there was no Lebanon, there was no Syria. There was no 
Israel, no Palestine, no Jordan, no Saudi Arabia. None of those existed. It was all the Ottoman Empire. And if you say, well, the spoils of war never should be used, well, then let's take the whole of the Middle East and let's wrap it all up and give it all back to Turkey. Uh, if you believe that Turkey would be the great successor to the Ottoman Empire, then for people who say that this is a result of colonialism, that we even have a nation there, then all the nations are the result of that. Then we need to go back to pre-World War uh, I and give all that land back to Turkey. By the way, if you want to do that, then I suggest we need to dissolve all 50 states in the United States and give them back to the Indians. Uh, much of that land we stole from them. No, see, it's not logical, nor does it make sense. It's simply the insanity of anti-Semitism. But uh, even in our modern age, even in, the, in recent years in our memory, uh, we have new states formed by what? Nationalist movements, Serbia, Croatia, Moldova. Uh, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, of states. If we were to go back into the middle of the 20th century, Greece, Italy, these all came about because of nationalist movements. So if I, if I set the Bible aside, set prophecy aside and asked about Israel, is it the result of a nationalist movement? Sure it is. Of course it is. Uh, the Jews in Israel wanted their land back. They wanted to be their own land. They were, they were uh, conquered by the Romans, and the Romans spread them throughout the world, and then the Crusaders came in, and then the Ottomans came in, and then the Muslims came in, and everybody's been taking them. It's their land. They want it back, and they wanted to be a nationalist movement. Uh, don't apologize for it being a nationalist movement. Yes, most of the other states were, in fact, nationalist movements. One can even look at our own United States and say we were the result of a group of our forefathers who were a nationalist movement who wanted to separate from Great Britain. If nationalist movements are, are the reason that you shouldn't have a nation, then let's all surrender our constitution and our rights back to Britain and become members of Britain again. Now, see, it's an insane argument, but it is one that Unfortunately, so-called uh, educated professors at college universities like to say that Israel is only the result of a nationalist movement. So today, false claim number three is that the Jews use violence to gain control of Israel. Jews use violence to gain control of it. As somehow, if violence was used, then that delegitimatizes uh, the right for the nation to be a nation in and of itself. Well, I guess if, if you're going to use that claim, again, I would go back and say that America has no right to be an independent nation because violence was used against Britain for us to become the United States of America. Uh, most of the nation states in the world are the result of violence. I find that those who say that violence is used to gain control of Israel seem to be those who have no problem at all that the Palestinians are using great violence to try to gain land that they think is theirs. Rather than go to a court, let a court decide, let's go and look at history to decide. Uh, they're using violence against civilians, blowing up civilians, killing civilians. It, it's amazing to me that, uh, yeah, there in fact was a war. What's interesting is that although some Jewish resistance groups occasionally use violence against Britain in the effort to gain independence, uh, many other people in the world, as I stated, have used violence to gain control of the world. I'm going to pause. Yeah, there's a I'm going to pause because they're coming in. So, Jordan, you can pick this up in a minute. So, do you want to pause that? Are they coming in or what? Why don't you stick your head out there and tell them all to be quiet, if there's some out there. And you two can't be talking when I'm doing this. It's distracting to me. You got to be quiet. We're doing a broadcast. Is there? A, is there? A, okay. Okay. So that's still running, right? Yes. So, so you know, the idea that the Jews use violence to gain control of Israel. There, there's probably not a nation in the world that that we couldn't level that accusation against. Certainly, the. The independent nations and the Russian Federation have used violence. Uh, violence was used throughout Europe. Violence, there's always when people have to fight for their rights. Uh, that hardly qualifies for saying that Israel doesn't have a right to exist. Uh, false claim number four says that the Palestinians controlled the land for a century. That's interesting. And, and this will kind of be a review of 
some of the things that I've said already. But you know, when the, when the Ottoman Empire lost control of Palestine after World War I, <laughs> there were no people known as Palestinians. There were Muslims, uh, there were Christians, and there were Jews, and assorted uh, other minor religious people living in a place called Palestine. Uh, the official listing for place of birth on all passports during those days, Jews included, was Palestine. So if you had a, a, a passport to travel around the world in 1921, uh, your place of birth was called Palestine. That name came from uh, the Romans' desire to remove Israel as a name from the history books when Emperor Hadrian uh, decreed in 132 AD that the province name would be Syria, Palestinia. In fact, he renamed Jerusalem as Aelia Capitolina and uh, in, in an attempt to erase that name. What, what was very interesting is the modern idea, and, and when you look at the history, Arafat, Arafat created a history that didn't exist. By the way, Arafat himself uh, claimed to be a Palestinian who was a freedom fighter in his land, uh, conveniently overlooking the fact that he was born in Egypt. He wasn't a Palestinian. Uh, he didn't even say, I, I come from here, but the world conveniently overlooks that. But the, the modern idea of a Palestinian nation actually only began to take fruition after the War of Independence in 1948. And that's when five Arab nations attacked Israel unilaterally, hoping to uh, destroy Israel at its birth. Think of this, the nation of Israel, uh, 1948, declared their independence from Britain. The British mandate is over. Britain takes the flag down. They're going to leave the country. And according to the British mandate, their whole purpose in being there was to create a Jewish state. So all that Ben-Gurion and the leaders were doing that day was doing what the British mandate said to do, what the League of Nations said to do, which was to create a homeland for the Jews. And so they announced the homeland for the Jews. They were doing what the world leadership of the day, the equivalent of the United Nations of today, had said, this is your land. You're going to have this land. It belongs to you. And when you're able to form a government and lead the land, uh, do so. So they did that. And at the moment of the founding of their nation, five Arab nations uh, immediately attacked them with the threat, not just to um, take the land, but to kill every single Jew. Absolutely amazing. And it's around that time that people began to develop an understanding of Palestinian as separate from uh, the Jews. Um, in that war, it, it, it's a very interesting thing, and, and I really wish I could take a whole broadcast just to do that, and maybe I'll, I'll spend some time today and uh, maybe sometime in the future do that. But in that war of independence, uh, it is very clear that Israel did what Israel was authorized by the world bodies to do, to decree a land. Now, we, can, we could sit here and we could say, well, yeah, but they had no right to this or that. Well, you, there's a difference between saying what is our land and saying you can't have any. And the Israelis, from the inception, were always willing to say, we'll talk about what is our land, but we have a right to be here. The, the Arabs uh, were never willing, and still aren't today, to say, what are your borders? Uh, what they said is, you have no right to even be here. And so the five Arab armies that, that attacked uh, uh, Israel at its birth with the intent to destroy it, uh, literally we're not saying we're disagreeing where, where the border is. They're saying you get no border. And again, remember what I, what I said earlier, if Israel has no right to have a border and be there, neither does Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, none of them, especially Jordan, which was part of the British mandate, none of them have any right at all to exist if Israel doesn't have a right to exist because they were formed during the same season under the same premise. Uh, so Israel was, was attacked by these Arab armies, and the Arab armies said this, we're going to come in and we're going to destroy the Jews. It certainly looked like they could do that. Uh, the five Arab armies were all trained by the British. In fact, in the assault against Israel, the, um, the British, uh, some British advisors were advising the Arab armies. Uh, I could have a great discussion, maybe I'll do that sometime, because uh, here in the office while we're broadcasting, I have Unique and Andrew with me, and they're both very verbal about the, the history of Israel, and Unique especially about the, the military history of Israel, and we could have a great discussion about 
you know, that, that battle and how it took place. Uh, Israel didn't have an air force, really didn't have an army. They had resistance groups. It, it really was like uh, the uh, Patriots were coming up as I'm doing this broadcast next week. It's Patriots Day. Uh, we, uh, we think of the American Revolutionary Army. How on earth did it ever defeat Britain? Uh, it certainly had divine aid in the midst of that. But what a, what a miracle story that George Washington and a ragtag of, of irregular soldiers should be able to defeat the, the mighty British uh, Empire. It, it, just, it just shouldn't have happened, but it did happen. Uh, in the same way, that's why as patriots, by the way, we should, we should be excited about Israel's history because organized armies, uh, five of them <laughs> surrounding Israel, came to destroy the nation of Israel. And the military, paramilitary groups quickly organized. Uh, they started buying planes from different places that could have the semblance of an air force. They didn't have, they didn't have tanks, they didn't have weapons that, uh, other than these primitive rifles and things, but miracle of miracles, uh, they succeeded. When the Arabs were attacking the cities of, uh, of uh, Judea, of Samaria, uh, uh, along the coast, what they told the Arabs there was this. They said two things, and both were lies. One is they said, you, you better leave because the Israelis are going to kill you. I, I'm not saying there were not any atrocities or atrocities on both sides, but the Israeli leadership never had a policy of killing civilians, whereas that was the policy of the Arab leadership. But the second thing they did is they told all the Arabs living in the Israeli towns uh, to leave, to flee east across the Jordan River, and so that we have a free shot. In other words, all our brothers, all our Arab brothers, get out of there so we can come in and destroy all the towns. We're going to bomb the towns and get rid of everybody. They didn't, didn't care who was there and basically didn't even care about their Arab brothers enough other than to say, get out because we're going to destroy them. And they said, in a matter of a few days, we're going to wipe the Jews out and then you can return home. And so there's written testimony that, that was recorded in, in 1949, 1950 by historians who went in uh, interviewing Palestinians who now are no longer in Israel, who said very clearly, that's what they were told on the radio by the Arab leaders, was to leave Israel and, to, uh, and, and then we're going to wipe them out and then you can come back. Now, were there Arabs who were driven out? Oh yes, of course there were, uh, just like today. Uh, you know, when people say, well, people are being driven out. Well, let me see, Syria, 200,000 people have been killed, 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 200,000 in Syria, in our day and age, and the world does not seem to be particularly keeping that in the front news, uh, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of refugees from Syria in, in a lot of places. Jordan is one of the primary places of refugee camps. Uh, I read just this morning that 10% of Jordan's population are now refugees from Syria. That's amazing. How does a Jordanian government pay for them? They can't uh, uh, support them, but that's where they're going. Um, are they being driven out? Well, you know, the, their towns are being bombed. And if their towns are being bombed, they're going to flee for their lives. And, and certainly there were Arab towns where uh, they were told we're going to bomb the town. And so the people left. So uh, that was happening. But the big thing that the, the, the news and the, and the modern historians and the professors in so many universities don't talk about was the Arabs saying, come out, we're going to kill them, and then you can go back. So the problem of the Palestinian refugees is not a problem that Israel created. It's a problem that the Palestinians created uh, themselves. And, and so that, that whole concept of dividing originally Jews and Arabs were all Palestinians. Uh, it was only after the war and Israel formed as a nation that the, the concept of a Palestinian uh, people uh, came about. Now, the, the understanding that the Palestinians controlled the land for many centuries, first of all, that's not true. Uh, for many centuries, the Ottomans controlled it. Uh, there was no Palestinian national movement when the Ottomans were in control. The Ottoman Empire out of Turkey controlled the whole Middle East. There is no evidence of a nationalist movement of Palestinian Arabs trying to get free from, from Ottoman control. But, but secondly, let's look at what happened after the war of 1948. Uh, that war never ended. That war came to a, uh, to a ceasefire. And what is known as the, uh, the pre-1967 border uh, 
is not a border. The news will talk about, well, the Palestinians have a right to, to a state and, and the Jews have to move back before the 1967 border. It was not a border. It was a ceasefire line. It's like what we have between North and South Korea right now. We have a ceasefire line. It is de facto a border between North and South Korea, but there's never been a, a treaty signed. So North and South Korea, South Korea still contend for that area. Um, so after the 1948 war, uh, an amazing thing happened. And by the way, you've heard me talk about Israel history in the past, and, and the same is true now, is that the Jews were winning. How many wars have been started in the Middle East with the Arabs saying, we're going to kill the Jews, drive them out, and then the Jews start winning, and the Arabs say, help, 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 these bad Jews are beating us up. The, the, the bad Jews never started the wars. Uh, you know, you pick on the bully in the neighborhood, and he turns around, and he's beating you up, and then you go to the policeman, and so the guy's beating me up. Well, why'd you pick on him? Uh, so the Arabs you know, said, help, 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 and the United Nations stepped in and called for a ceasefire. The Arabs never would agree, have agreed to a ceasefire, never, if they weren't losing. If they were winning, there was going to be no ceasefire. But because suddenly the Israelis were winning, uh, they decided to have a ceasefire. And the ceasefire, they simply drew a line where the troops were, that's what a ceasefire does, and all of, on the, the east side of the, of the uh, line became what is known as the West Bank. Now that confuses people, if it's on the east side of where they were fighting, why do they call it the West Bank? It's the West Bank of the Jordan River, and it's actually the Jordanians who gave it the name, the West Bank. And so at the ceasefire, that whole section that the, the world now calls the West Bank, the Bible calls it Judea and Samaria, and the Bible says that land belongs to the Jew. I don't care what the world says. God says that what we call the West Bank, the Bible calls Judea and Samaria, and the Bible says it belongs to God's people. Now. When that ceasefire was signed, uh, all of that became the, 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 uh, the West Bank, and it was under the control of the Jordanians. Now, interesting, the, the Jordanians, first of all, they, they thought they would annex it. Now, Jordan is four times the size of Israel. They don't need more land. Matter of fact, there's no Arab nation that needs more land. Uh, the Jordanians wanted to annex that at one point and make it part of Jordan. The Arab nations didn't want them to do that. So Jordan alone wanted to say, okay, we're going to take this land and unilaterally we're going to make it part of Jordan. And it was the, it was the Arab nations themselves that wouldn't, wouldn't allow that to happen. During the next almost 20 years, Jordan controlled that land. Jordan controlled the infrastructure, the roads, the schools, the electricity, the water, the rights of the people. And during that 20 years, there was no such thing as a Palestinian movement. It didn't exist. There was no such thing as a nationalist movement among Palestinians to have their own state. There, there were no Palestinians, even though they, they were stateless. <laughs> they, were really, they were not given Jordanian citizenship. They certainly didn't have Israeli citizenship, so they're in this thing called the West Bank for 20 years, and, and, and there's no voice coming out of them saying, we demand our own state. We have a right to a Palestinian state. We, there was none of that. And Jordan, their, their, their Arab brothers, uh, made no move to create an independent state. Not only that, Jordan spent very minimum money, if any, to improve their road, schools, electric, and everything. So the, the standard of living in the so-called West Bank was as poor as the rest of the poor uh, Arab nations, and Jordan, as the occupying power uh, in control of the West Bank, did nothing to improve the conditions of the Arabs. Despite that they were not doing anything to help the Arabs there become full-fledged members of their own state, despite the fact they were not helping them develop their own state, despite all that, there was no move to create a Palestinian state. So where did this move for a Palestinian state begin? Began after the war of 1967. Again, a war in which the Arab nations gathered and said, we're going to destroy Israel. And you know that is the Six Day War. In six days, Israel defeated the combined armies of Egypt, of Jordan, 
of Syria, of Lebanon. They, they defeated the armies and ended up in control of the whole West Bank, right up to the Jordan River. The Jordanians were defeated and fled. Jerusalem was once again uh, in the hands of the Israelis. It's only after that that Arafat created this myth of our desire for a Palestinian state. It wasn't a desire for a Palestinian state, it's a desire to get rid of the Jew. And when the Jordanians were in control, they didn't want it, and now they do. Now the interesting thing is, so Israel's been in, in charge, if you will, of the bulk of the West Bank until the Oslo Accords, and I'll say more about that perhaps next week. But Israel uh, immediately began to improve the roads, improve the schools, improve the water supply, and, and improve the health care to such an extent that the Palestinians living in the West Bank, the Arabs living in the West Bank, have a higher standard of living now than most of the people living in Jordan. The Israelis took better care of the Palestinians than the Jordanians ever did, and yet this movement says we need, we demand, we have a right to our own state, a uh, uh, Palestinian state. So the, the idea that uh, somehow or other the uh, Palestinians have always been there, Despite what Arafat said, it, it's a false claim and needs to be proven so. Well, this is Pastor Don Long. Here we are on News from Another Perspective, and we'll continue this story next week. I hope you'll join us.